Hey, thanks for joining us for today's sermon. My name is Phil. I'm one of the pastors here at Berean Baptist Church in Mansfield, Ohio. And we would love to help you connect to your next step towards following Jesus. If you visit our website at bereanfamily.com, you can reach out to us. We would love to pray for you and just connect you to the ministries here, what God is doing uh, in our region. And so please check us out. Hey, uh, what a great morning. What, what fun is, is it to come together as a family and just sing praises to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Amen? And we get to then, from there, we get to jump into His Word. Uh, speaking of which, if you want to turn to Mark chapter 1, uh, we're going to be starting that today as we are in a series now in this Gospel of Mark. And we'll be in Mark now for several weeks, so... Um, Buckle up, it's going to be a kind of a quick few weeks, several weeks, uh, just because of the nature of the Gospel of Mark. It's an action-packed Gospel. Only 16 chapters, but a lot is going on in those 16 chapters. I I want you to know, I feel like we talk about this quite a bit, but probably not enough, how, how wonderful it is that we can praise God and read His Word together without fear of persecution. Let us never, let us never lose sight of what's happening around the globe. There are people just like you and I who love the Lord, who are committed to Him and preaching His Word, that are risking their lives in order to do so. Because of the sensitive nature of it, I won't tell you which organization it is, but I got word this week that Uh, in a training center somewhere in the world where it's not legal to preach Christ, there was a raid and two people were arrested and they're facing life imprisonment for preaching the Word of God. This is real and it happens. There are people who who are going to be killed probably this week for preaching God's Word. Friends, let's not take, let's not take and miss sight of the importance of this Word. If, if you're just visiting today or watching online and you have another church home or, or maybe you, you, you go here now but you won't be going somewhere, going the, here for long, I don't know what the case may be. Wherever you go, would you make sure they preach this Word? Otherwise, it's just a TED Talk and it's not going to change your life. The Word of God is what has the power to start changing the, our lives. And we must demand that it is preached in truth and in grace. Again, we're going to be in Mark chapter 1. I don't want to spend a lot of time before we jump in, so would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for a morning filled with praising You. You are so good. You are so good to us. God, I thank You that we can do this together, that we can have this this joy And I thank You that there are people all over this earth that are facing persecution, but who are faithfully preaching Your Word and praising Your name. Thank You for them. Thank You for the joy and the peace You give them in the midst of that struggle. God, would You grant them safety. For those two who have been arrested, God, would You give them favor with the government officials? Would You allow for their release so they could go back to preaching Your Word faithfully? God, as we go to Your Word today as a family, would You speak in and through it? And would it cause us to become more like You? We love You. In Jesus' name, Amen. I'm going to go ahead and start by reading Mark 1, 1 1-13. through So again, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Otherwise, the text will be on the screen behind me. I say almost every week, but we do have Bibles in the uh, Connection Center. 
So if you don't have a Bible and like one, we'd be thrilled to give you one. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make His paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to Him and were being baptized by Him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. There is a lot going on here in these first 13 verses that we're going to unpack today. Um, and, uh, but I want to start with a little bit of context uh, of this Gospel. This Gospel of Mark was written by John Mark. This is the, the, uh, um, he was likely an early believer and follower of Jesus. Most commonly believed to have been a teen during Jesus' earthly ministry. This is the same John Mark who traveled with Paul and Barnabas. Uh, why does he have two first names, John and Mark? Well, John was his Hebrew name, and Mark is a, his Roman name, which gives kind of a hint to who his ministry was focusing on. Uh, this is the second of the four Gospel accounts written in the New Testament. Also the second of the three Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they cover about the same period of time and many of the same stories in mostly the same order. Um, there are some debate as to when this was written, um, but somewhere we know for sure between 50 and 70 A.D., uh, most scholarship would point to an earlier date, an older date, closer to 50 A.D. Uh, it was written from Rome while Mark was in Rome. Uh, likely learned a lot. Mark uh, likely learned a lot from t the teaching of Peter. Peter later in the New Testament calls him his son in the, in the, in the ministry. Uh, but he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So, so understand, we believe that the entirety of the Bible was inspired by uh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit giving the words to those authors. Again, it was written specifically to a Roman audience. Uh, it lacks the genealogies of Matthew and Luke. And there's lots of action in this Gospel. Again, there's not, not a lot of narration between the stories. It goes kind of from one story to another to another. You'll hear the word immediately happen uh, or being used quite often. Uh, Jesus did this and then immediately went to that. And that's how this book is this letter is written um, it goes from one act of Jesus to the next very quickly uh, today we're going to move quickly to go into three different things here uh, three important events that occurred at the beginning of Jesus's earthly ministry and for each one of them we're going to talk about how they apply to us all right so the first one is this the ministry of John the Baptist um, you ever go to a concert and see an opening act <laughs> and John the Baptist is kind of the opening act of Jesus, but I think he's better than most openers. Um, uh, but, it's, but so we're going to start right again to Mark 1. I'm going to read again verses 2 through 8, so we're going to discuss that about John the Baptist. It says this As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to Him and were being baptized by Him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me 
comes He who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist was a prophet who was predestined and set apart to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. Uh, Isaiah was written about 500 years or so before Jesus, so for quite some time, the nation of Israel should have been waiting for this man. Listen to Isaiah 40, verse 3. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then later on in the prophets, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. This was the fulfillment of those prophecies John the Baptist was in what he was doing. He, he was a popular prophet. Many people came to him to confess their sins and to be baptized. Some of the Pharisees regretted coming to him uh, as he called them out in their sin. He, he was set apart having taken the vow of a Nazarite, which included not cutting his hair, abstaining from alcohol, and some other things. He lived like a mountain man. It, it, by the way, is this description of John the Baptist how you pictured me in Alaska? <laughs> I'm just, instead of camel hair, maybe moose hair or something like that. He's wearing leather and eating bugs. I'm, I'm curious, is anybody here willing to say, I would eat locusts and honey? That's fine. I got no problem with that. Anybody? A couple of you? Well, you know what? I'm going to put that to the test. I have some grasshoppers. I just kind of want to see. This has nothing to do with nothing, but you'll remember it. Anybody willing to try one? Come on, up here. I knew it was going to be a Marine. It had to be a Marine. There you go. And this is real deal. I mean, they're grasshoppers. There you go. There you go. Oh, he's going to get more. All right. All right. I have to have more for the second service. All right. Good job, good job. I actually had several of those this week, and they're, they're surprisingly good. They're not that bad. Sadie Combs ate one. I was very impressed with her. Well done, Sadie. Um, good job. So that went faster than I thought it would. I'm not going to lie. You jumped on that like you were waiting for it. You're like, I smell grasshoppers. John the Baptist's job was to declare the coming of the Messiah. Our job is to declare that He has come, that He has lived a perfect life, that He died on a cross and He rose again. So in a lot of ways, our job as the church, capital C, mirrors that job of John the Baptist. In some ways, the life of the ministry of John the Baptist was a foreshadowing of the work of the church. While He was preparing the way for the coming Messiah, we declare that He has been here and He is returning. While, while you are likely not called to, ever, to never get a haircut, although some of you wish that was the case, right? It, you probably aren't called to live in the wilderness. Probably not called to eat bugs as your majority of your um, diet. But you are called to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ until He comes. So again, we can learn some things about John the Baptist. Or from John the Baptist. He gave his life up for the proclamation of the coming King. Friends, what are we willing to give up? By the way, he ended up losing his head for his job. What are we willing to give up? to proclaim that Jesus has indeed come and He is returning and He is good. Again, three important events that occurred at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And I want to talk about how they apply to us. The first, of course, being the ministry of, the John, of John the Baptist. And the second is this, the baptism of Jesus. You know, I, I had the privilege of doing some, a lot of baptisms in my life. I'll tell you about one of the maybe stranger ones when I was in Alaska. Um, and it happened to end up being one of the most embarrassing ones too. I got to tell you, I may have shared this story, I'm not sure. Um, I was baptizing a young man who is a prince of Tonga. I, I've never heard of Tonga before this happened, but here I am set to baptize this young man who is a prince. And uh, my daughter Hannah must have been, I don't know, 
maybe 10 at the time, had a birthday about that same time and wanted to have a sleepover at her house to celebrate her birthday. So she had her friends come over, and like any good dad who's super, super manly, I let them paint my toenails. <laughs> this was on a Saturday night, and Sunday morning I had quickly forgotten that they had painted my toenails. I took my shoes and socks off to get into the baptistry with young Prince of Tunga. And I see the young man doing like this. <laughs> I think I said, ne never mind, let's pray, you know. The Prince of Tunga, it seems like it was pretty important. I later found out that pretty much every young guy in Tunga says he's a prince, so I don't really know. But in the moment, it seemed important, okay? Okay. He seemed important. Friends, he could have been the king of England. He could have been the most important person in this world. That's nothing like having to baptize Jesus. And John knew who he was. Can you imagine Jesus coming to you to be baptized? That's what John the Baptist experienced here. It says in verse 9, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when He had come, came up out of the water, immediately He saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on Him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are My beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. And we know from Matthew's account that John objected to this baptism. He, he objected to be the one to baptize Jesus. Listen to Matthew 3, verses 13 and 14. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the, Jordan, uh, to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? I think we can kind of relate with John the Baptist right there, right? Um, I don't see why I should have to baptize you. You are Jesus. You are the creator of this world. You see, John's baptism was a baptism for the remission of sins. And Jesus was sinless. So it kind of begs the question, why is the sinless Creator of this world being baptized by a sinful man for the remission of sins? Well, Jesus answers that question again in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now for for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then He consented. Jesus was baptized. He was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, not for the remission of His sins. His baptism was also foreshadowing His death, burial, and resurrection that was to come. It also identified Him with the sinners that He had come to save. Jesus being fully man and fully God. And finally, he modeled what would become believer's baptism for us in our day. You see, Jesus' baptism, there is this public show of the triune God. I don't know if you picked up on this. The Son being baptized, the Father expressing His pleasure in the Son, and the Spirit descending upon Him. You see a picture of the Trinity happening there. Now, if you are a follower, I want to talk about how His baptism applies to us in our lives. You see, if you are a follower of Jesus, part of following Him is following His example in baptism. Part of following Jesus is following Him in baptism. If you've yet to be baptized, I, you know, I, I've known people over the years who have been Christians for decades and thought, I feel embarrassed to get baptized now. Please don't. Please don't. It's a part of our journey of following Christ. And it's a joy and a privilege for us to be a part of that. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't been baptized yet, would you come and talk to us? See us. We would love to baptize you and be a part of that. Um, you don't have to come to me right now and interrupt the service. You can, you can email us at info at, I think I have it on the screen, info at bereanfamily.com. So if you or somebody you know wants to be baptized, hasn't been so yet, would you please email us at info at We would love to get that taken care of and be a part of that celebration with you. Let us know you'd like more information there. So again, we have, uh, we have starting up here, we have the ministry of John the Baptist. And the ministry of the John the Baptist kind of foreshadows 
in some ways, the ministry of the church. While he proclaimed the coming Messiah, the church now proclaims that he has come and he is returning. Also, we see the baptism of Jesus, this very important event where the sinless Son of God came to save man and to start this thing off. He gets baptized for the remission of sins by a sinful man. Absolutely incredible. And then the third part that we get to is the temptation of Jesus. The temptation of Jesus. And that's going to be in verse 12. Excuse me. So Mark 1, verses 12 and 13 says this, the Spirit immediately, there's that word immediately, you're going to see that a lot. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Again, you see this word immediately in the Gospel of Mark quite often. Uh, He moves from one vent uh, to another quickly without a lot of narration in between. Um, You're going to see that as we go through. It's an action-packed Gospel, gospel account. <clears throat> Excuse me. You see here, Jesus is continuing in his obedience. First, being obedient in baptism to his Father. Now he's being obedient, being with. He's withdrawing himself to be alone in the wilderness for forty days. Did anybody ever watch like Bear Grylls on Survival, or one of the, the Survival TV shows? Just like three of you, so it's probably not the best illustration. Um, well, let's just say he goes out there. He he doesn't bring a lot with him. But he's got a knife and some things and he makes himself shelter and he eats the wild things and all that and then goes back and stays in a hotel at night when the cameras aren't rolling. Um, Jesus didn't have that opportunity. Forty days, he goes out into the wilderness. And we're talking, when it says wilderness here, it's not talking about Malabar or Mohican. This is wilderness in a wild place uh, in a desert where he's going to go survive and not just survive on the land for 40 days, but be tempted by Satan during that time. Jesus, again, continues His obedience here. Now, Mark doesn't include all of the specifics when it comes to uh, Satan's temptation, but again, we can go back to Matthew, uh, another one of the synoptic Gospels, and see a little bit more there. And for that, I'm going to read kind of a, a chunk of text here in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1-11. through 11. So I'll give you just a second if you have your Bible and you want to uh, flip over to Matthew chapter 4. It says this, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and sent him, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. I want you to notice how the enemy attacks here. I want you to notice how he attacks. Jesus was hungry. What did the enemy offer? Food. He offered him bread. Turn these rocks into loaves. You can eat. You don't have to go through this. Does the Father God really want you to go out here and to suffer and not eat? You've got the power within yourself just to go ahead, make that rock a loaf of bread and eat and be full. You see how he attacks? Oftentimes in a subtle way. The enemy took him to two field trips. He took him on a couple different field trips to tempt him to put God the Father to the test on one of them. And on the second, he tempted him with pride. He tempted him with pride. How did Jesus defeat his enemy? Anybody? 
with the Word of God. He defeated the enemy with the Word of God. We can learn some things here that are important for us. Number one, Jesus was tempted. You too will be tempted. In fact, all of us have been and will be tempted to do the wrong thing. And we've been given a primary source, a primary tool to defeat that temptation. And it is the Word of God. If you do not know this Word, if you do not know this Word and how to apply it, you are in danger. You are in danger of succumbing to temptation. You see, all of us are going to be tempted concerning three different ways. It's going to be the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. All of the things that will tempt you will fall into one of those categories. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And our primary way of defeating those temptations, to stand against those temptations, is knowing and applying the Word of God in our lives. This is why it's so important that we spend time in His Word. By the way, it's a joy to spend time in God's Word. Honestly, it is. I, I love going to God's Word and just kind of and just reading through and just seeing what the Lord has for me on a certain day. It's a joy to communicate with God. And by the way, God wants to be communicated with and He wants to communicate with you. He wants you to take and set time aside every day to get into His Word. Listen, I'm not talking you have to sit down for eight hours a day and just sit there and read through Scripture. I, don't, I feel like that's probably too much unless you can take way more than I can take. But take five or ten minutes. Five or ten minutes. Listen, I think one of the greatest weapons that the enemy has against us right now is the clock because we get, we get so busy doing things that don't matter a lot that we don't have time to do those things that we should be doing. I don't know how many times I hear people say, like, man, I wish I, could, I wish I had more time to do things like that. You do. It's all about your priorities. Make time for it. Man, maybe you have a commute. Maybe you're living in Mansfield and you commute to Columbus every day. There's an app on your phone. The Bible app on your phone will read the Scripture to you on your way. You're so much less likely to start screaming and road raging at somebody if you're listening to the Word of God being preached to you, Right? I hope. Or you're going to feel silly real quick, right? Read, listen, take in the Word of God. This is our defense. or It's, it's our offensive weapon that we can use to fight against the enemy. The Word of God is your defense. Jesus being fully man, but also fully God, demonstrated for us how to win those battles over temptation. Again, we have the ministry of John the Baptist and, and what that foreshadows, the, the church, the ministry of the church. While he was proclaiming the coming of the Messiah, we proclaim that he has come and that he is returning. We, we see Je Jesus being um, um, obedient to baptism. The baptism for the remission of sin. The, the Holy Son of God, the sinless Lamb of God to fulfill the righteousness, to fulfill all righteousness. If Jesus thought it was important enough for Him to do that, friends, we ought to be getting baptized if we haven't done so already. And then the temptation of Jesus and learning from Him how He uses the Word of God to combat against the temptation that He faced. This is what we need in our lives. Friends, God's Word has everything we need to live a victorious Christian life. Everything we need. All the information we need to have. We need to know it. We need to memorize it. And we need to obey it. I've got a challenge for you this morning. Three-part challenge, because I like things in threes. The first one is this. Be a modern-day John the Baptist and share Christ with others. Be a modern-day John the Baptist and share Christ with others. Now, that doesn't mean you have to eat grasshoppers. All right? And if you do, you're going to want to floss pretty quickly. When I ate these the other day, I had the little legs in my teeth. and Yeah, you got them still? Yeah. Number two, if you haven't already, follow Jesus in baptism. If you haven't done so already, follow Jesus in baptism. And number three, know God's Word and use it as your defense against the enemy. 
or your offense as it's an offensive weapon. Um, before we close with the band coming up here, uh, we've got some guests in the, that came in uh, over here. Some of them are missing it looks like, right? Are they coming back in? All I see is a bright light. So we've got some um, friends from Ukraine here. Uh, so Grace Church Brovery. Um, we're, we're, I want to just introduce real quick Sveta and Mira. Sveta was a widow of Pastor Boris. Uh, Mira, their daughter. And we have some grandkids. If you guys would stand up real quick, would you welcome them? Uh, before we move any further, I want to just take a second. We'll kind of, kind of close with prayer, but let's pray for them as well. Could you join me in prayer? Uh, so a couple around you, maybe just kind of come up and put, lay your hands on them. That'd be great. All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to come to praise your name, to read your word, to learn from it. God, we, we do so with this realization that not everybody is as free to do so as we are. God, as I think again about our brothers and sisters that are in the persecuted church, God, would you watch over and protect them? And now we have these sisters and some kids here with us that are in an area that is being torn apart by war. God, would you bring peace to Ukraine? Would you end that war? And God, would you be with our sisters and their families? Would you give them protection? Would you give them peace? And would you give them opportunity to further your kingdom? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as soon as we're done here, I'm going to be done in just a second. We'll have another song. Um, ladies, if you could kind of stick around the front, so if you want to come and greet them, I know a lot of you have visited them before in Ukraine, so uh, immediately after the service, if you wanted to come greet them up in the front, that would be great. Uh, we do have a couple opportunities I want to let you know about before we uh, leave. There are two short-term mission trips that we're going to be doing this summer. Um, I know some of them have been asking, uh, when are we going to be able to do a trip again? Well, we're doing two of them almost at the same time, so you probably don't want to do both. Um, from, let's see here, July 5th through the 14th, we're, we're going to be taking a group to Costa Rica to work at a campground and to make a connection at a local church down there. Again, that's uh, July 5th through the 14th. Um, uh, if you're interested in that, please let us know. And then we're going to have a trip to the United Kingdom to that church uh, that we're helping to revitalize in a town called Kirby, just out of Liverpool, to do some work beautifying the building. Uh, Tony Chirico is going to be leading and heading up that trip. Both of these trips, we're going to have an interest meeting next Sunday after the second service in the chapel. So if you have any interest at all in one of these two trips, um, come see us in the chapel next Sunday after the second service. At this time, why don't we go ahead and stand back to our feet and let's continue to praise God. <laughs>